Um, before I properly start, I'd just, just like to ask you to do something first. I'd like you to think of a picture that, for you, sums up, captures the process of evolution. That's what the talk's going to be about. What about evolution? So, yes, think of a picture that sums up evolution apart from Charles Darwin, <laughs> which might be the top one. Have you all thought of something? Okay. Now, are any of you thinking of this? That's good. Yes, yeah, a really, really famous picture. Um, it's well, based on a picture called The March of Progress by uh, Rudolf Zallinger, for what it's worth. He made it in uh, 1965. Um, and yeah, it seems to sum up uh, the origin of man, not from a chimpanzee, although it does, that, that thing does look a lot like a chimpanzee, uh, but from our last common ancestor with chimpanzees, the last common ancestor we share with chimpanzees. So effectively, it's our great, 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 several million times uh, grandparents. And as you can see, what it's really depicting is a change in the way we move around. So we start off as these sort of shambling, shuffling, four-legged things, and then gradually rise up. It's the literal rise of humanity uh, onto two legs, uh, which might come as a bit of a surprise when we think about what makes humans different from other apes. We often think, oh, okay, we've got these huge brains. Uh, we uh, can talk to each other. We have this fantastic language. Uh, we've got these wonderful opposable thumbs that we can operate iPhones with, all of that stuff. Um, but yet here we have the main process of evolution, the thing that a lot of you thought of first. Um, and it's putting forward that what makes us different is the way uh, we move around. And I think this is absolutely right. And I hope to convince you uh, that the way we move is indeed what really makes us uh, what we are. Not only that, but if you look at the entire history of life, um, the movement from place to place, locomotion, the direction of a body from place to place, is the most important thing uh, that life ever did. And I hope to convince you of that uh, by the uh, end of the talk. Because uh, from a certain perspective, it's actually quite easy to explain why this is. Now, of course, moving around is really important. Um, now, for instance, if you're able to move faster uh, than your friends, like so. Um, you can do all sorts of things. So if there's no food there, um, you can get the bananas uh, faster. <laughs> so you're going to get the one that eats, you're going to have the supper uh, that night and your, your, your shambling friend uh, isn't. Or if there's a tiger on the prowl, it uh, means that you're going to be the one uh, that escapes uh, the tiger, and this, of course, is really important fundamental stuff. Uh, those creatures which get the bananas, those creatures which escape the tigers, uh, they're the ones that survive. They're the ones, importantly, that are going to reproduce. They're going to have babies. And if the characteristics that make them better movers are then passed on to their offspring, it means that those offspring are going to be better movers than anyone else. And then in the next generation, the same thing's going to happen. The ones who move better are going to be the ones that survive. They're going to pass on those characteristics to their offspring. And this is going to happen generation to generation every time uh, these creatures are getting better and better and better at moving, escaping the tigers. And it's not just a question of going faster. It's a question of not using up too much energy while you're doing it as well. It's no good getting the bananas if you're just going to be burning through them all the time um, and wearing yourself out and uh, you're running out of energy for the important business of baby making. Um, so the idea is that no, this process will continue and continue until an animal is basically moving as well as it possibly can uh, in its environment. That's the kind of the understanding. Or until it starts to you know, move, movement starts to compromise some um, other, other function. Um, and so thinking again about what makes humans so special, well, the understanding then is that we should be really uh, very good at moving. And indeed we are, although we often take it very much for granted. So I'm doing something very simple here. I'm just kind of pacing back and forth. Um, but there's an awful lot going on here to make sure that we're doing this as cheaply uh, as possible. So you know, if I was to sort of start off walking, it's you know, a very simple thing to start. Again, you probably wouldn't you know, be aware of what's going on here. If I told you to walk, you'd just walk. Uh, but what's actually happening, there's a set of muscles uh, that run from our hip bones here to the top of the leg. And if I were to contract them on this side, uh, it's effectively what's going to happen is that the leg's going to move like that. But if my legs are on the ground, I'm just going to be popped forward onto the other leg. Then there's another little muscle that's running up the front of my leg there. That gives a little pull, and then I start falling forwards. And from that moment on, that's effectively all I'm doing. I'm continuously falling. 
Uh, so using very little energy. And of course, the thing that stops me from falling flat on my face is that uh, the other leg is, uh, being, uh, is in position to kind of save me uh, from that fall. Um, but even that, I'm not really using any muscles for that either. The, the, the leg is just swinging forwards naturally. It's like a pendulum. And we're just kind of falling forward. So using very, very little energy to do this very, very important task. Uh, of moving from place to place. And what muscle activity there is, is really subtle uh, little sort of tweaks to make sure that we're nice and steady. So uh, you can try this yourselves at home. Uh, as you walk and put your hands on your back, uh, you'll feel that there are these little muscles that run up the back that are just giving a little tug every time we take a step. That's stopping us doing that every time we uh, take a step forward. Uh, those muscles at the tops of the hips, they're always active as well. Uh, they make sure that as we start moving over one leg, the body doesn't lurch to one side, which would obviously be a little bit inconvenient. So that keeps the, the torso nice and stable. Um, we roll over our foot as well. All these little kind of little, little sort of nifty little uh, subtle tweaks to make sure that we move absolutely as efficiently as possible. It's just right down here. Okay, so that's how I walk. But what if I want to go faster? Things are going to be a bit problematic then, because now it's all very well I'm using my legs very passively as they are here. Um, but you can't now. If you don't want to try and push that faster, it's just not going to work. So obviously, if I want to go any faster, uh, there are two things I could do. First of all, I could simply take bigger steps. So instead of just walking like this, I could do this. Obviously, I'm now losing a lot more uh, muscle power, so that's not really going to work. That's no good. Or I could uh, just take more steps in a given time. So instead of doing this, I could do this. Uh, but again, now my legs are not moving naturally. I'm having to kind of you know, force them to move a lot faster than they want to go. So again, it's all rather inefficient. And this is no, this, surely we, we can do better than this. And of course, we can. If we really want to increase the distance between the steps, of course, we can run. Gaily prance. Um, and of course, by this means, we can greatly increase the stride length. And also, we do this very, very efficiently. Uses a slightly different physics to what we do when we're walking. Uh, for instance, uh, we have. Oh, let's just sit on the table. Hello. Um, <laughs> There's a tendon that runs down the back of the legs here that attaches to the heel called the Achilles tendon, after the Achilles heel. Um, and this acts as a little energy storing spring so that as we're running, um, we absorb some of the, the shock of impact and store it in that spring, and then it helps us leap up into the air again. So again, it's all very efficient. It's all very effective at getting us moving uh, as well as we possibly can. Um, so yes, we are very, very good at moving, um, but of course it's not just the kind of the direct, oh yeah, before I get to that, yes. So you can really make this point very clear about how well we are at moving if you compare us to some of our walking robots. <coughs> so this is quite a famous thing called Asimo, uh, so Honda's famous robot, and it's very impressive. No, it's, it's, it's a walking robot, and not, not, it's a difficult thing to do, but it's very energy intensive. I mean, if I was to kind of you know, walk like this, it's, it, 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 looks, it always reminds me of um, you know, like it's done something wrong, and it's trying to kind of escape from the scene of the crime um, without anyone noticing. No, so we are really very, very effective at doing this. Um, but it's not just the direct uh, act of our locomotion that's important. Now, that, that rise of two, onto two legs is so important. It's also the consequences of that. Uh, first, of course, it means we don't need our hands to walk anymore. Uh, so our hands are free to use tools, to make spears, to operate iPhones, all of that kind of thing. Um, it was also once we raised onto two legs that we were able to hunt Meat, this is really the, the, the point at which our ancestors started to, to hunt instead of just subsisting on you know, fruit and leaves and things. Um, not because we were especially fast. No, we're up against things like antelope, and they're, they're, no, they're, they're pretty nifty on four legs. Um, but because by standing on two legs like this, uh, we're much better at keeping ourselves cool. Um, because in our African ancestral home, the sun is directly overhead most of the time, uh, so we're presenting very little area to the sun, so we can keep cool that way. And also, just by being taller, um, the wind is stronger the higher up uh, you go. So because we can keep ourselves cool, it means we can run our prey to death. We can kind of keep running after them, running after them, running after them, until uh, they drop dead uh, from heat stroke. And that was really important. Now, once we started getting a lot of meat in our diet, uh, the nutritional quality of our food went right 
up, which, mean, which meant that we didn't have to put so much resources into making big guts, we could put it into the brain instead. So it's once we started uh, to eat meat, thanks to the fact that we were very good at moving around on two legs, that's when our brain started to get really big. So it really was a very, very significant change, this move uh, onto two legs. Um, now, uh, once again, so our ancestor there, our last common ancestor uh, with chimpanzees, is depicted very much like a chimpanzee. You know, effectively, that is uh, a chimpanzee. So a question may by now have occurred to you, because of course chimpanzees are still around. Um, and I may have painted a picture that they're kind of a little bit rubbish uh, moving. So no, this, this is not what evolution should be, surely. No, they, 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 why have they not all died out by now? And indeed, why don't they just walk around on two legs? Um, well, they can, uh, but they're not uh, terribly uh, good at it. Um, Part, and it's all for all sorts of reasons, but I'd like to just kind of draw your attention mainly to the pelvis, which I'm just going to show you there. I have a human pelvis here, a model of, <laughs> before you wondered. Um, I'd hoped to have a, a real chimpanzee pelvis here as well, but apparently it's got held up at customs. Can't think why. So anyway, so that's, our, um, that's the human pelvis. Um, and uh, so the chimpanzee pelvis is, is there. I'd just like to kind of compare those two. So the chimpanzee pelvis is obviously much taller uh, than ours, and it doesn't wrap around the sides. It's a very sort of blade-like, thin from the side uh, looking pelvis. To see what effect that has, I'd like to have a volunteer, please. A volunteer would like to know how, it, like to feel what it's like uh, to walk uh, like a chimp. Do you want to kind of come forward? Thank you very much. So what's your name? Maya. Okay, so... We need to think about some of the consequences of having a, a pelvis of that different shape. First of all, because it's very tall, uh, well, you can kind of see it there. The, the back doesn't curve as much in a chimpanzee uh, as it does in a human. So um, that's actually very important for us. When we're sort of standing bolt upright, our spine is curved. Chimpanzees can't do that. So they're always going to have to sort of angle uh, their body forwards. Do you want to kind of just, just there we go, to angle body forwards? And of course, if you're not going to topple forwards, you're going to need to kind of bend those knees. Um, Already, we're spending a lot of energy just keeping ourselves uh, upright. Not only that, but chimpanzees' legs tend to go, they don't angle in like ours do. They, they're, kind of, they're, they're kind of sort of widely spaced. And they don't have, their big toe is like our thumb. It sticks out to the sides, uh, not forwards. So they don't have that foot roll that we use. They have to put their weight on the outsides uh, of the feet. So, it's, yeah, it's getting quite complicated now. Um, also, because the, the, the pelvis doesn't curve round like us, they don't have the same muscles that can keep our body stable on the pelvis. So, when they're walking, they have to kind of lurch the body from side to side. Should, should we give this a go? So, we've got to kind of, every time. So, there we go. So, make sure that the weight is very much on the sides of the feet. And you keep swaying the body from side to side. So it all starts to get quite exhausted. I'm, I'm getting quite tired. Um, yes, yeah, so that's how chimpanzees Well, Thank you very much, Shemaya. Lovely. <laughs> you walk like a chimp beautifully. Um, yes, yeah, so there are all sorts of things which make chimps uh, somewhat worse uh, on two legs uh, than us. All to say, by the way, just incidentally, uh, that sort of side to side sway is not the only way you can compensate for a lack of muscle action here. You can also twist the spine in the opposite direction. Uh, and this is actually something that humans do, well, some humans do uh, quite a lot, because it's basically the catwalk. It's when you're kind of swinging um, the bum. Um, so why they walk like this is, is a question for another day, but that's, yeah, that's a slightly different way of compensating for not using uh, those muscles. So yeah, so let's have a look. No, so, so do chimpanzees actually move like this? Well, yeah. So here I've got a little um, uh, video uh, showing a chimp. So obviously I'd like to focus on the one that's standing on two legs. And you'll see its legs are bent. It's, uh, it's angling its body forwards. It seems to be being a bit fucked out there because everyone else is being fed, but not it. Um, it does get the food eventually. Um, yes, it's a very, very ineffective. The only way it's not, not the only reason it's not using its hands to, to support itself is because it's trying to catch the food. And indeed, this is really only the only time you're going to see a chimp walking on two legs is when it's carrying something. Normally, they'll do something like this. Uh, so walk on all fours. Slightly weird way of walking on all fours. You'll notice that it's walking on its knuckles. 
So not palms flat, it's walking on its knuckles. So it's a rather unusual way of walking on all fours. And it's actually quite an inefficient way of moving, uh, that, that sort of you know, four-legged uh, chimp mover. But yes, that is indeed uh, how chimps move. So you might ask, well, why are they doing this? Why have they not become like us, uh, more masterful at uh, sort of walking around on the ground? Well, the problem with the chimps, of course, is that they're not just living on the ground. They have to contend with life in the trees as well. In particular, they often, you know, they're very good at climbing vertically up tree trunks. And this is where that big pelvis, um, very sort of thin uh, from the side view, really comes into its own. It's very good at giving the legs a very powerful push uh, when they are fully uh, flex. So then, uh, chimpanzees are very, very good at climbing up trees. And that's the compromise. They can't be brilliant at both things. Um, so they, they, they take a, a bit of a hit with walking on the ground so that they can be sort of very effective in the trees. So now we have a possible answer as to why chimps did not become uh, like us, and indeed why we um, uh, became as we did. Because um, about six, seven million years ago, Africa, our home at the time, uh, was becoming a lot drier, a lot more seasonal. And the rainforests, which used to cover great swathes of Africa, uh, were fragmenting. They were sort of splitting into little bits. And the story goes, so we're getting, we're getting less of this, rainforest, and more of this, the savanna. And so the story goes, the chimpanzees were the ones that stayed in the trees and basically kept on doing what um, their ancestors had been doing, whereas the ancestors of humans moved out into the savanna where they no longer had the compromising demands of moving in the trees and could become much, much better at moving around uh, on the ground. So that's, that's the kind of the, the, the classic story of how we came to be you know, brilliant at walking on two legs. But there is a bit of a problem because just because we came down to the ground, why should that mean we should therefore move up onto two legs? There are lots of four-legged things that move on the ground really, really well. Um, so famously, of course, the cheetah. A beautiful thing. And here we can see the real benefits of keeping um, that four-legged uh, way of moving. Uh, look what its back's doing. Uh, so its back is extremely flexible um, as, it, uh, as it's kind of galloping along like that, which means it can extend its stride length enormously. Now, the stride length of this thing, you'll notice its hind legs come down in front of the forelegs uh, as it's, as it's um, running along. So its stride length could be anything up to about seven meters, which is three times uh, what a human being can manage uh, when we're running at full tilt. Um, we can gallop, not what to say. Um, this is a gallop. This is a human gallop. Um, but actually, it's our least effective uh, gait. Uh, walking and running are both far better, far more efficient. Um, because we just don't, we, because we're only on two legs, we can't use the flexibility of the back uh, to extend the stride like cheetahs do. Um, so it's a bit of a question. Why have we lost that? Why are we turning our backs on this, this fantastic way of moving around? And the question is given added force when you realize that a lot of our close relatives, you know, looking beyond the apes now to monkeys, like baboons, they move around on the ground, and they, they never went onto two legs. They, they came down out of the trees, just like we did, and they move around on four legs, and can gallop and do all that. Not quite as good as a cheetah, but they can do all this stuff as well. So we have a question, why are we not like this? <laughs> why are we not on four legs? And actually, you know, when you start to think in these terms about you know, why, are we not move, you know, why are we not moving in a certain way, all sorts of other questions start popping up as well. For instance, why can't we fly? <laughs> Flight is an incredibly efficient way of moving around. It's really fast. You use up very little energy to go from place to place. It's really safe. And there are very few predators that can get you when you're flying. Um, so no, why can't we fly? If movement is supposedly so important, if locomotion is so important. Or indeed, for that matter, why don't we have wheels? Now, we make a lot of use of wheels. It's a very efficient way of moving around. You can kind of give it a little push and then coast. Now, think of a cyclist on a, on a downhill. Um, actually, I'll deal with this one first, because actually this is the easiest one to back away. Uh, to bat away. It's actually quite easy to explain why we don't have wheels. Um, wheels are fine if you're able to build them. If you want to grow them, it's a bit of a different story, because you'll notice there, of course, the problem with a wheel is that the wheel has to be completely separate from the axle. 
Um, so there's no, you're never going to be able to run any blood vessels from the two or nerves from the axle to the wheel, or they'll just get twisted up and snap. Um, so that doesn't work. What's more, I mean, wheels are fine if you've got roads, nice, flat, solid surfaces. Uh, but imagine I was on a little tricycle and I, I came across this. Um, I'm not going to be able to get up these stairs. So, no, if there's any kind of decent obstacles in your path, wheels are really not all that good. So that's easy enough. But back to our you know, more pressing question about why uh, we're not on four legs. To answer this, we're going to have to look at some uh, more of our reasonably close relatives, now notably gibbons. So gibbons are apes, like chimpanzees. Um, but um, uh, they're, they're our most distant uh, ape relatives, basically. So they're, they're well known because they've got these very, very long arms. Uh, so well known for kind of swinging around in trees. And I've got a little video here. Just like to keep an eye on it. It's, it's quite a long way away, so it's going to be difficult to see. There it is. So it's doing what gibbons do. So swinging acrobatically from arm to arm. It's the Tarzan thing, basically. This looks like incredible fun. I wish we could do this. Um, in a minute, it's going to jump from one tree to the next, and I want it to keep a really close eye on what it's doing, or what it does straight afterwards. Uh, here it goes. And hello. So keep your eye on it. There. Do you see what it was doing? So it was running on two legs. Uh, up in the trees. And we now have every reason to believe that actually this is how our ancestors moved around in the trees. Our distant ancestors weren't really that much like chimps at all. They were a little bit more like gibbons. Not, not quite as extreme as gibbons. Um, but we became two-legged in the trees. And really it's the chimpanzees that have become slightly specialist. They become specialist tree climbers. While well, we've really just hung on to a very ancient way uh, of moving around. Um, and this is not, by the way, just based on evidence from living, uh, living creatures. Uh, we have certain fossils which show us that this is probably uh, you know, coming close to the truth. Uh, so this is the, the fossil of a hand of a creature called Ardipithecus, or Ardi for short. Uh, it's about four and a half million years old. Um, I just wanted to note that that hand is very human-like in its overall proportions. That's important because in chimpanzee hands look very different from that. Uh, partly because of the way they hang around in trees, also because of the fact that they knuckle walk. Remember this characteristic way that chimpanzees move around. It seems our ancestors weren't doing that. So yeah, it seems that we became two-legged in the trees, not on the ground. As to why, this is probably related or probably happened at about the time that we went from the monkey stage uh, to the ape stage. So monkeys tend to scamper along the tops of branches. Apes are more upright when they're in the trees and they clamber. So it's just a rather different way of moving around in trees, probably related to the fact that apes got quite a bit bigger than monkeys. And that seems to be uh, where the, the seed was sown for our two-leggedness. Uh, which brings us to our next question about why uh, we don't fly. Well, no, from a certain perspective, it's actually kind of easy. No, from the, no, my current form as a big ground-dwelling creature, I've no chance of ever evolving uh, flight. Uh, that's because evolution, master craftsman though it is, can only work gradually. Now, the sort of change you're going to get from one generation to the next has to be very, very small. And if I, was to want to, if I wanted to take off from the ground, I'd need enormous wings. And they're going to have to appear overnight, along with all the huge muscles that are going to operate them and the behavior which can sort of operate these wings in the right way. It's just too big a jump. So no, from that perspective, it's easy to see why we can't fly. Evolution is just not going to do it for us. But... Our ancestors, of course, lived in trees. They were a lot smaller. And here, flight is much, much easier to evolve. And to show you why, again, I'm going to require two volunteers this time. So you and you. Do you want to come and join me? So uh, you two, so what's your name? Matthew. Matthew, good name. <laughs> and Anwan. Anwan, not so good name. Um, so I'd like you to kind of uh, basically create a rainforest for us. So go on. No. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Yeah, perfectly. So yeah, so just, just two trees. There we go. Um, and we're going to... So actually, if I can just give... Yeah, so if you hold that. There we go. It's a nice tropical fruit. And I'm going to come behind you. So this is um, a little tree-dwelling creature. Hello. Um, and the idea is it's got to get from here 
uh, to there. He wants to get, uh, yes, so he wants to kind of get uh, uh, that lovely, juicy pomegranate there. And it's, oh, it's a little bit far for it to reach. Um, so, of course, one thing it can do is head all the way down to the ground, crawl along the floor, and then head all the way up again. But that's a lot of energy being wasted. And, of course, also uh, rather dangerous because there are lots of predators around on the, uh, on the forest floor, and we know what happens when they're around. <sighs> and we know what else happens to this. No. Um, but there is another option. I just actually just quickly ask you to kind of return to your seats for the moment, uh, but I will require your... Um, your services again shortly. So I have here a couple of beautifully rendered models. Um, just to show you what happens if you start to develop wings. And notice that no, one of these, the green one has very little stubby wings, and the blue one ha has very long wings. So these are kind of illustrating two steps in the evolutionary process. So wings, when wings first appear, again, because it's got to be gradual, they're only going to be very small to begin with, and later on they might get a little bit larger if they offer some tangible benefit. So to show you how this works, I'm just going to have to pop up here. Again, simulating being up a tree. So here we go. So I'm going to throw this one first, so the, little, the, the, the one with the, the little wings. Um, uh, this should just fly straight, but if it does come towards you, uh, cover your eyes. <laughs> Don't want any, any lawsuits. Um, my public liability insurance isn't that good. Um, okay. So there we go. So there's that one. And now the bigger one. Oh, yeah. Well, of course, as a living creature, you'd expect it to have a little bit more control uh, on the impact. Um, but I hope you saw that that made quite a big difference. So to begin with, if you've got little stubby wings, uh, you're going to be moving down at quite a steep angle, whereas as the wings get bigger, you're going to be able to glide at a shallower and shallower and shallower angle. Can I have my trees back, please? Thank you very much. Oh, great. Yeah, and with the pomegranate. Thank you. So our little guy up here, so if it was to develop no little flaps of skin, perhaps, um, then it has a much, much easier way uh, of uh, getting to the pomegranate. So now it could, could sort of glide down like this. So this is kind of early stage, and it's done at that. Avoiding all the predators on the floor. Still quite a big climb before it gets the fruit. But of course, as the wings get bigger and bigger and bigger, it's going to be able to glide more and more shallowly. So we're getting that benefit every generation, and that's the important thing, so it can then eat its lovely, tasty fruit. So that's all fine. And we have every reason to believe that this is why... So stay there for a second. I'm going to give you another bit. Every reason to believe that this is how flight often get started. So we often, well, we, we have plenty of flying squirrels. Actually, yeah, I do have a picture of a flying squirrel, which I can show you. There we go. So there's a flying squirrel. Um, would have happened, they say, would have got its wings in much the same way. And it's happened many, many, many times, this. So we have you no know, gliding lizards as well. So this is a thing called Draco. Um, we have gliding snakes. We have gliding frogs. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a common evolutionary path. But there is one problem. So you can put the fruit down now. Thank you very much. I'm going to give you a branch instead. There's your branch. Now, if you can just come a little bit closer and hold them out. There we go. Actually, I <laughs> don't want a lightsaber fight. Um, so, um, so if we just sort of hold them more or less. There we go. I'll just show you. So there we go. So you want to get them like that. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Let's go through the undergrowth. Because, of course, the trouble is there is usually another way of getting from tree to tree cheaply uh, without having to bother with all this uh, flying stuff. Is that Our little guy can just run along the branches, do a little jump, and then run along there as well. Now, it very much depends on how good it is at negotiating these very fine branches. Thank you very much, you two. You have fantastic uh, tree work. Yeah, it depends very much on how good you are at being able to kind of move around on these little branches. And this is one thing our ancestors were really, really good at. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is a loris, uh, a loris, a slow loris. And look at its hands, and you'll see it's got these little opposable thumbs, the things that we often think, oh, it's our big thing, it's how we, it's our tool using things. But there we have a little, no, it's, it's not a monkey, so it's a prosimian. Um, it's closely related to lemurs, if you know what they are, and it's got these little thumbs. And it's, those thumbs mean that it can wander along these narrow branches 
with ease. And if you're able to wander from branch to branch with ease, you'd never need to bother with any of this flying nonsense. So that's really why we can't fly. It's not because we wouldn't kind of benefit from it if we were able to discover the pathway to it, but we're just too good at hopping from canopy to canopy because of the opposable thumbs. So the irony is the opposable thumbs do seem to have kind of you know, deprived us uh, of the joy of flight that we see, of course, in birds. Um, also, have a little quick word about birds. Um, I imagine probably most of you are aware what group birds came from by now. Do you want to just shout it out? Yeah, very good. Oh, God, yeah, excellent. Yeah, so uh, birds seem to just be highly modified dinosaurs. Um, they came from things that were sort of rather like Velociraptor. I imagine you all have a pretty good picture about what Velociraptor looks like, thanks to Jurassic Park. Um, didn't really look much like, very much like that at all. We now know that Velociraptor was covered in feathers. Um, might even have had stubby wings. There's a bit of a controversy over Jurassic World that they didn't do this. Um, they didn't put those feathers on. Some of us are very upset about that. <laughs> Um, but yes, yeah, so that's, that's what a Velociraptor looked like. And this is a bit strange, because of course, things though, these sorts of dinosaurs are often pictured as two-legged, ground-dwelling creatures, like us. Um, and I'm just saying, well, we're never going to be able to evolve flight from the ground. How come these are able to do it? Um, now, for a long time, it was thought that these dinosaurs did work out how to fly uh, from the ground up. Uh, but we now know that that's not how it happened at all, thanks mainly to this wonderful fossil. Uh, anyone know what this is, by the way? It's not Archaeopteryx, but a good guess. Anyone? No. So this is Microraptor. Uh, Microraptor. So like Archaeopteryx, it has feathers preserved on it, discovered in China uh, back in 2003. Um, so those are, some of the, those are the feathers I've highlighted in blue on its arm. But also, amazingly, it's got feathers on its legs. Uh, and these are proper flight feathers. So this is a four-winged dinosaur. Um, so we're probably looking there at a gliding tree-dwelling dinosaur from which uh, birds like to, or no, something like this is probably what birds uh, evolved from. So actually dinosaurs are probably not doing something that dissimilar to what the other flyers uh, were doing. Um, but obviously never had those opposable thumbs so they had to turn down a different route to get cheaply uh, from tree to tree. So as you can see, you know, you know, this, you know, the evolution of locomotion is, is full of these twists in the tail. You know, evolution sometimes unlocking certain doors and closing certain others. So our opposable thumbs made us great in the trees and later made us great with tools, but shut the door uh, to flight. And uh, the history of locomotion is peppered with this sort of thing. Um, and I'm just going to show you another one. So this is um, uh, connected with how we vertebrates evolve. So vertebrates, we're the things that have backbones. And I'm going to talk now about the origin of uh, that backbone. First of all, I'm going to show you this little guy. So he's coming from you know, one side of the screen. There he is. Um, so that's an earthworm, of course. Um, probably rather similar in the way it moves uh, to, um, uh, to that of our um, early soft-bodied invertebrate ancestors. Just want to kind of to clock how it's doing it. So it's alternately making its body long and thin and then short and fat. Now the idea here is that when the body is short and fat, puts anchors in and then extends the body forwards and then the rest of the body catches up and then it squeezes forwards and then extends that way. So it's, it's just basically waves of muscular contraction uh, running forwards uh, down this creature. Uh, a lot, very many invertebrates move like this. Um, and I'm going to need another volunteer. Someone from this side, maybe. Um, yeah, you look like a likely chap, so come on down. This is where the splinky, the slinky comes into action. I'm sure you're all wondering what this was. Okay, so I'd like you... Sorry, what's your name? Alex. Alex. Oh, brilliant. Lovely to meet you, Alex. Um, okay, so I'm just going to get up on the table here. You're not to do that. <laughs> Again, it's just not safe. I need to put that down first. Oh, excuse me while I do this rather inelegantly. Okay, so what I'm showing you here... There we go. So this is a worm. Um, we're looking at a slightly different view now, but no, basically we're going to pretend to, to try and reenact uh, the motion there. And Alex here is going to provide uh, the muscle power. So can you draw, you know, grab the end of that string? Just the string, there we go. Okay, there we go. And could you give it a good old pull? Keep going, keep going. Yeah. 
So that's basically how the earthworm is shortening its body. It's got muscles that run from the front to the back, and every time they contract, the body gets nice and short and fat. Thank you very much. You can let go now. Um, I will need you shortly because, of course, we are not soft-bodied. We have a backbone in the middle. Thank you very much, Alex. <laughs> Did fine work. So what I'm going to do now is insert a backbone. Now, obviously, it's just a hose. It's not really a backbone. But it will do for our purposes. So I'm uh, just going to thread it through like so. Um, you may wonder, of course, our backbone is not like this at all. It's a secret. It's a, it's a chain of bones, not one great long hose-like thing. Uh, but actually, the evolutionary precursor of our backbone, which is the thing called the, uh, the notochord, in mechanical terms, is actually very much uh, like that hose. Uh, even down to the, the little sort of spiral uh, strengthening um, strings that sort of run through it. It's going to insert the Allen key. This wasn't quite how the uh, backbone first appeared. Now insert key A into slot C. There we go, but we're now just about ready. Um, so this now is our new and improved version of our worm. Oh, God. I can, yeah, I'm standing on the string, that's fine. Okay, so there we go. Once again, could I have a volunteer, please? Uh, yes, so if you can make a bit. Oh, just squeezing. Oh, there we go. What's your name? Miles. Miles, fabulous. So if you want to do the same on us, so once again, just grab that and give it a pull. So very different now. Rather than the body getting shorter, the body, <laughs> the body, bends up. it just bends up, yes. Now, it's, it's gone all twisty and curly because it's just a hose. It's not really a very um, well-designed <laughs> piece of kit, but yes. Yes, um, unless, of course, it had some way of contract, had some sort of muscle running down it, where it, which would contract it, like. Yep, you're absolutely right. And of course, virtually, thank you very much. That's, thanks, Miles. <laughs> Great work. So that shows you really the big difference about what a difference that backbone makes. It means that we're still able to get it, it's still quite flexible, but the body can't shorten. So if those muscles pull, the body bends. And this, of course, is how the very first vertebrates uh, moved around. So I've got a nice little video here. Ooh. It's a mako shark. Just know its body's moving, so they're undulating from side to side. Are all thanks to the presence of that backbone. And it's also kind of illustrating nicely why this is so useful, because being able to move that body from side to side like that is a fantastically efficient way of swimming, which is one thing that the worm, the earthworm, is, of course, extremely bad at. So what we're looking at with the backbone is really a swimming adaptation. But there is a real twist in the tail, because as you'll notice with sharks, like many fish, have uh, fins sticking out to the side. And under certain circumstances, they can be used in a rather different way. So this is a bamboo shark. And I hope you can see what it's doing. So it's using that side-to-side -side bending of its body, um, along with its fins, uh, to walk on the seabed. Um, so here we have a kind of unexpected consequence of the evolution of that backbone. It's great for swimming. But under certain circumstances, you can use it for walking as well. Starting off with the seabed, but of course, if you make your skeleton a little bit stronger, maybe increase the range of movement of those fins, uh, then it's going to be competent for moving around on land. Um, so yeah, so this is a salamander. Again, illustrating that same side-to-side -side bending that the backbone provides. Uh, but this time, it's walking on land, not swimming around in the sea. So it's a real kind of ironic twist in the evolution of life, that vertebrates, if you went back to the beginning of the vertebrate history, you'd think, yeah, these are swimming creatures. They're going to stay in the water forever. But because of that unexpected consequence of the backbone, they made it uh, onto land. OK, I'd just like to introduce you to a friend of mine, if you're wondering what this guy was. So I have here a giant Madagascan hissing cockroach. Beautiful thing. I don't think it, it's... Pro oh, yes, it's actually hissing for us as well. There we go. Hello. There we go. So I don't know if you can see that from here. So it's quite a big, chunky insect. 
Um, the chunkiest one I could find at short notice. Um, so yeah, originally from Madagascar. Um, I'm really just showing it to you just as a kind of note, an introduction to the world of the arthropods. Um, it may not seem that we have very much in common. I, or maybe we do, I don't know. Um, I don't know what you, th you think of me so far, but yeah. Um, so there is our Madagascan hissing cockroach. But there's actually something really fundamentally similar uh, between the, um, my body and the body of this Madagascan uh, hissing cockroach that goes right to the very heart of what it means to be uh, an animal on Earth. Because if you look at us, so we basically share the same basic blueprint. So we both have a main axis so that runs from top to bottom of me, from front to back uh, in the cockroach. So there's the body. Uh, there's a clearly defined front end. Of course, remember that oh, no, I have tilted back now, so my old front end is now my top end. Uh, but no, our cockroach has the front end as well. And obviously, the other end, uh, the back end. Uh, left and right are more or less symmetrical. It's the same between me and the cockroach. And the front and back are designed along rather different lines. So the mouth is at the front. So that's where my mouth is. The mouth of the cockroach is at the front. Uh, the sense organs, the long-range sense organs, are also at the front. Uh, we both have eyes. Um, the cockroach has antennae. I've got a nose for sniffing out uh, chemicals. Um, the anus is at the other end. <laughs> it's best perhaps not to show that in too much detail. Um, not only that, but actually, if you look, we all have repeated units, repeated propulsive structures uh, that run down that main axis. Uh, so I've got two pairs of limbs. It's got my arms and my legs. Um, the cockroach has three, uh, so six in total. Um, and and you know, plenty of other, um, arthropods, um, of other um, arthropods have many more than this, like millipedes or something. And of course, um, uh, and it's obviously symmetrical uh, on the two sides. And it's not just the legs that are part of this same scheme. No, the legs aren't the only things that are repeated down the axis. Of course, there's vertebrates, uh, no antennae. Um, we have the vertebrae, no, the, 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 the bones that make up our backbone. They're repeated down the axis. Uh, the muscle blocks that we see, they're both in vertebrates and earthworms, also repeated uh, down that main axis. So there's something really obviously quite fundamental going on here. Um, and this is not just some fluke. Uh, we now know a lot about the genes which control this developmental pattern. And they're basically the same in a cockroach and in a human. Now, our last common ancestor, so our great 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 great, -great grandparents, uh, lived about 600 million years ago. And yet the genes which control our overall body patterning have changed so little in that time that you can often take a gene from one guy and put it in the other. So for instance, the genes that control where our eyes go gene called Pax6, fabulous name. Um, you can take a Pax6 gene from a mouse, pop it into a fly, and the fly will develop entirely normally. You know, it, it recognizes the mouse Pax6 gene as its own. It's changed that little in 600 million years. So there's something really obviously fundamental going on here. And the reason is, of course, as always, is because this blueprint is a fantastic way of reliably producing very effective locomotory bodies. So let's think about the fact that you know, the front end has the mouth and the eyes. If you're moving consistently in one direction, of course, it's the front end that's going to encounter food first. So you're going to want the mouth to be at that end. It's the front end that encounters the environment first. So you want the senses to be up at that end. Unless you want to be continually moving through your own poo, best to put the anus at the other end. And when it comes to those, you know, that repetition of the legs or the repetition of the muscle blocks, um, thank you, you've done your job fine. Thank you very much. Oh, dear. There we go. Feel free to come and have a look at me hissing cockroach later. Um, so, yeah, because you've got all these repeated you know, sort of legs or whatever, um, you can use them in a very, very efficient way. Now, are you familiar with Mexican waves? Prove it. Start here, so three, two, one, go. Oh, it's beautiful. Thank you very much. Um, this is a really, really common trick uh, in the animal kingdom. So you see it very obviously in something like a millipede, which has got loads and loads of legs. Basically, it's just running a Mexican wave uh, down its legs. 
Uh, the reason is because it means that the body can move very, very smoothly. Uh, so it's not a lot of sort of jerky sort of stop start. Uh, it's able to, no, the legs are doing the kind of jerkiness, but the, the rest of the body, the big massive body is moving very, very smoothly. So it's very efficient. It's not using a lot of energy in this process. And it's really, really common in the animal kingdom. So we don't just see it in things like millipedes. Um, we humans do it as well. I mean, it's not very obvious because you've only got two pairs of legs. But as you can see, my uh, back legs, no, my legs are going, they're my arms. That is a Mexican wave. Um, insects do it, earthworms were doing it. So that wave of muscle contraction that moved down the earthworm, it was doing it as well. The swimming motion of fish, all based on this same Mexican wave pattern. So no, a really fundamental aspect of what it means to be an animal because it's so effective at uh, producing efficient locomotion. And obviously to control this, we need a nervous system that can do it. Um, so we tend to find in you know, many, many different animal groups that you know, don't look overtly similar, but a very similar sort of organization of their central nervous system with a series of branching nerves, uh, often a central cord uh, going down uh, the middle, and then a brain up at the front to gather information from the senses and then relay it uh, to the rest of the body. So what I'm effectively implying here is that the brain, the reason why we've got a brain at the front end, is because of locomotion. Our brain is for locomotion. And all the other stuff, the thinking, the pondering, the emotions, that's just an added bonus. First and foremost, that brain is a computer to run movement. Um, now, when you think, sort of look at these sort of uh, Mexican waves and there's sort of multiple legs that uh, many animals uh, use, uh, something else often springs to mind. Um, I often sort of think of one of these sort of uh, these ships. This is a Greek trireme. Uh, the only reason I use this is because it's public domain, so we don't have to pay copyright. Um, uh, so it's using you know, a series of oars. It's, again, repeated propulsive units. They're like the kind of legs of a millipede. Interestingly, of course, that if you, I know, I'm sure if you've ever seen the Olympics or ever watched sort of rowing races, um, we don't row using Mexican waves. Um, we operate them all synchronously. That all the uh, oars go together. And that should be a less effective way of doing it. So I'm really curious, I don't know if any of you have access to rowing teams, as to what sort of benefits we might be able to get if we implemented the Mexican waves that a lot of animals do in our rowing teams. Who knows? There might be a wonderful medal hall uh, if we can get this right. Now, of course, you might argue that it's going to be very, very difficult to get this to work because the timing has to be absolutely precise, otherwise the oars will clash. This is true of animals as well. They have to time those legs just well or the legs will clash. Um, and, of course, that's going to be rather difficult to do uh, with a whole lot of independent you know, in, you know, single individuals uh, operating these oars. Having said that, it's one of my favorite animals. Hard pressed really to think of this as an animal at all. Are, it, 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 have any of you seen one of these things before? Yeah, they're not very well known. It's this thing called, a, oh, you have. Oh my goodness, have a gold star. Yes, it's a siphonophore. Yeah, you probably are aware of one of them. So the Portuguese man of war is a siphonophore, often thought to be a jellyfish. It's not actually a jellyfish. In fact, it's not a single animal at all. Uh, what we're looking at here is a colony of tiny jellyfish-like animals. So all those little kind of tubes that you're seeing running up that, that kind of central axis, they're all little mini jellyfish. So they're independent individuals. Um, but they coordinate their actions, and they coordinate it to produce a Mexican wave of squirting. So these are little jet-propelled things. Um, so these guys can do it. Uh, why can't we uh, and coordinate the actions of our rowers? These have a bit of an advantage. Um, this particular group, they have a way of basically hooking the nervous systems of the, these the, um, neighboring animals together. Of course, that's something that we humans uh, can't really do yet. So maybe this is just uh, a pipe dream. So I hope you can now appreciate um, how important movement, locomotion has been um, to the evolution of the animal kingdom. But surprising as it may seem, even the plant kingdom is also dominated by the need to move. Now you might think, oh, this is crazy, of course plants don't move. How could they possibly be dominated by locomotion? Okay, so the plant adults can't move, but they still need to be able to disperse their offspring. They don't just want to chuck their seeds right down at their feet, otherwise they're going to be growing on top of each other. 
uh, the next generation is going to be competing uh, with its parents. The pollen is going to need to get from plant to plant somehow in order for reproduction to work. So actually, quite a lot of what we see in the plant kingdom, the evolution of the plant kingdom, is really focused on making sure that these things happen, that pollen gets to seed and that the seeds get taken away as far as possible. I mean, just the height of a lot of plants is one very good start. So if you're using the wind to disperse your seeds or your pollen, the higher up you are, the higher up you release those things, then the further they're likely to go with the wind. So you know, that, that height, the trunks of trees are really a locomotory adaptation. They're, getting, they're making sure that the, the next generation moves as far away as possible. But of course, we have some more sophisticated things than simple height. And again, if I can just oh, jump up on the table. Um, so I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with sycamore seeds. Oh, it's already doing it. Um, so sycamore seeds, those little helicopter-like things. Uh, this is something a little bit similar, not closely related, but a similar kind of strategy. Uh, so I've got here the seeds, actually technically the fruit um, of a tree of heaven. Um, and I hope this, this works okay. It didn't last time. There we go. So you see what they're doing. So they're all sort of tumbling. <laughs> I'm going to have to clear that for a minute. Um, they're all kind of tumbling around and spinning sedately. They're basically, in a rather strange way, gliding in a very tight uh, little circle. Um, and the idea is that if they're able to kind of glide like this, then they're staying in the air as long as possible. So if there's a little gentle current of air, it means that those seeds get taken as far away as possible. Um, the absolute champion of this sort of strategy has to be this thing. Uh, so this is the seed of a plant called the Javan cucumber. It's, obviously it's in the cucumber group. It's not, no, the fruit doesn't look like a cucumber. Um, so it's a, it belongs to the liana uh, group, so you'll find this in, uh, in the tropics. Um, and these seeds are released from the bottom uh, out of um, uh, these open-bottomed husks. And uh, if I just get back up again, I'll show you how it works. Uh, so this is a, a proper glider and a very beautiful one at that. Um, make sure I get that around. So there we go. Oops. Isn't that lovely? <laughs> so a very sophisticated aerodynamic solution to the need to get your seeds as far away from the parent as possible. But of course, using the wind is only one way of doing this. You can also, and although plants don't move themselves, plenty of animals around, and if you are clever, you can use them. Um... Of course, we're we'll familiar with bees. Our bees are in a bit of trouble at the moment. I must, must kind of stick up for our bees. Um, of course, they are landing on these flowers. They're after nectar and pollen. Um, and you know, the idea is that they're going to take it back to the hive and feed it to their offspring. But of course, they're not going to feed all of it. And as they go from flower to flower, they are delivering pollen from plant to plant. So what the Deflophanus is effectively doing, it has conscripted the bee as a, a little delivery boy, basically, or delivery girl. Um, the worker bees are all female. Um, so in, in, a, in a sense, thanks to the presence of those flowers, which attract the bees, um, the bee becomes an extension of the plant. Now, the bee becomes the plant's wings and eyes and brain and legs. Um, and that's the way that the plants are able to very precisely direct their pollen exactly uh, where it needs to go. Um, that's fine with pollen. Insects, no great at dispersing pollen. Not so good at dispersing seeds, because seeds tend to be a little bit heavier uh, than, um, uh, than pollen. Uh, it's hard to imagine a, um, a butterfly getting very far with a cherry stone. Um, but of course, there are lots of big animals around as well, like us vertebrates. And here we see a function for these rather delicious, uh, freshy fruit. Of course, the idea here is the seeds are in the middle. Uh, the idea is that a vertebrate comes along, scoffs the fruit, takes the seeds away in its digestive system, and then deposits them somewhere else. So once again, by being very clever uh, and employing bribery, uh, plants are able to use vertebrates uh, to get their seeds exactly where they need to go. Right, so I'm very... Oh, I'm going to regret this now. So both plants and animals, as I said, have been dominated by the need to get to move from place to place. But we are kind of Johnny's come lately in the grand scheme of things. Now, big, 
visible creatures like us that are visible with the naked eye. Um, they date back to about 1.2 billion years. That's quite a lot, obviously, 1,200 million years. Um, but the history of life is a 4 billion year history. Um, and for all that time, before you know, big creatures like ourselves cropped up, the world belonged to the single-celled. And here, uh, we really do see the restless heart uh, of the living world. So what we're looking at here is bacteria. So some of the simplest life forms on the planet. In uh, coagulated coffee, for what it's worth. Yeah, so don't drink coagulated coffee. Um, and they're constantly uh, on the move. Um, so some of the no, simplest creatures on the planet, even they are really very effective at moving around. And not just moving randomly, they're able to find their way towards patches of nutrients, patches of food. Again, because it is so very, very important to be able to do that, to find where the goodies are and stay away from the nasties. So yes, locomotion is probably one of the very first things that life learned how to do, and an immensely significant step. Um, now, a lot of us are kind of often starry-eyed about the evolution of DNA, and RNA, the origin of cell walls, and all sorts of this stuff, you know, the, the core biochemistry of life. And rightly so, it's, you know, it's, it's a sort of extraordinary evolutionary transitions which gave the, you know, us the living world as we know it. But unless locomotion had been evolved as well, uh, the living world would barely justify the name. Because it's only through movement that creatures can encounter each other. And it's only once they start to encounter each other that we start seeing predators and prey, competitors and cooperators, um, and sex and symbiosis. These are all the kind of hallmarks of the living world uh, as we know it. And it's only locomotion that makes that possible. So before this came along, before, creatures, before and the, the, these creatures were able to move, life was really just very, very complicated chemistry. And only with the onset of locomotion did life really come of age. So that just about brings me to the end. There's just kind of one little final thing um, I wanted to talk about. Because um, now, once you appreciate uh, the impact that the history of locomotion has had on ourselves, um, I find it gives you a very deep sense of connection with the rest of the living world. Because it means that now, a lot of the stuff we do, we're effectively reenacting a lot of the things that our ancestors did, often millions, hundreds of millions of years ago. So for instance, now every time we kind of give a thumbs up or operate those iPhones, we are recalling, reenacting the movements that our early you know, monkey-like ancestors use when they're in the trees. Every time we kind of you know, shift our back from side to side, we are reenacting those undulatory waves that our fish ancestors uh, used. So I'd say this, I think, is um, a fantastic way of you know, exploring the connection we share uh, with the rest of the living world. So I hope you've enjoyed that sort of whistle-stop tour. Great, just about in time. Um, whistle-stop tour of the history um, of life on Earth. And I hope you could do appreciate that it really was one of the most important things that life ever did. And if you're interested in learning, finding out more, as well as seeing some of the things I had to skip out, like zombie ants, and sneezing sponges. Um, I have written a book on this topic. Uh, there's plenty available in the stand outside, and I'd be very happy to uh, sign any books if you wish to buy them. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.